Good morning, everyone. I'm Gail Hogan, and I am your moderator for this webinar. If this is your first time joining us, the purpose of this webinar series is to give you the data, facts, and answers as we know them today, and we do know things are changing every day. This is to better help you protect your business and your employees during COVID-19. A few details before we get started. All attendees, with the exception of our speakers, are muted. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website. Throughout the webinar, you may submit questions for our experts through chat, and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. And if we can't get your question here, we will capture your questions and reply to you after the webinar, or you may email your questions to covid19consulting at osumc.edu. And we will give you that email address a little later on. Again, um, here with me are experts from the Ohio State University Wexford Reynolds Center, and we welcome there with us this morning, beginning with Dr. Andy Thomas, the Chief Clinical Officer and Senior Associate Vice President for Health Sciences at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. Dr. Thomas has worked on the front lines of Wexner Medical Center's response and management of COVID-19 and serves as an expert on providing best practice on a safer return to the workplace. And Dr. James Borcher is director of the Division of Family Medicine, Sports Medicine, and head team physician at the Ohio State Department of Athletics. Welcome to you both. Dr. Thomas, I know we're starting to see some upticks in COVID-19 cases. Can you share with us the latest data and trends that you are seeing? Good morning, Gail. Thank you so much uh, for being here again with us uh, today, and thanks to all those attending. Uh, I will uh, pull up my screen and show a little uh, data to show some trends that are going on in the state. Uh, can you see the PowerPoint slide, Gail? I can. Thank you. Wonderful. So just to remind uh, folks, the state is broken up into eight emergency management regions for hospitals. When I talk about Zone 2, which is the zone that includes Central Ohio, that includes Regions 4, 7, and eight. Uh, so some rural areas of the state in region seven and eight, and then region four, as you can see, stretches from northwest of Columbus down through what we would consider uh, the counties of, of central Ohio. So if many of you become familiar with the uh, Ohio Department of Health public health advisory system and the uh, color-coded map that's produced each week. This is the color-coded map from two weeks ago. Uh, this is the color-coded map from last week, and as you can see, there is a trend towards more red uh, counties, uh, which is obviously concerning. Uh, there'll be a new map that'll be released today, and I've not seen the final version yet, but I'm not sure there's going to be much change. Uh, certainly, I don't believe there's going to be much improvement in the color code of the map based on data I saw earlier in the week. Uh, but at this point, if you look at the red counties, uh, they do include uh, Columbus, uh, Cleveland, and Cincinnati areas, also includes the, uh, the Dayton and Toledo metropolitan areas, as well as the Akron-Canton areas. Now, about 65% of the state's population are in a red county currently. But one thing that's significantly different than where we would have been if we had this map in April or May or even over the summer is the distribution in rural areas of the state. Um, it's uh, if you look at cases per hundred thousand or cases per capita, uh, Franklin County currently ranks in the 30s out of the 88 counties where we were in the top 10 for most of the spring and summer. So, a lot of the rural counties, even though they have a smaller number of cases, they have a significantly smaller population. So, their cases per hundred thousand are significantly elevated. Uh, Putnam County, for example, in northwest. Um, Ohio, uh, the, the CDC says a case rate of 100 per 100,000 in the last two weeks is a high incidence. They're at over 400 per 100,000, so over four times the, the height of uh, what the CDC considers high incidence for a geographic um, area. So th this data looks at the number of patients in the hospital on any given day in our zone. Once again, that central Ohio area, then south and southeastern uh, Ohio. As you can see, this is data from uh, yesterday. We actually surpassed our peak from the summer uh, in terms of the number of patients in the hospital and are now comparing ourselves back to early May in terms of uh, the number of patients in the hospital with COVID on any given day. The state of Ohio on, two, on both Monday and Tuesday broke records. Uh, as compared to any time during the pandemic, we have the most people with COVID in the hospital. Uh, zone three, which is the Dayton and Cincinnati areas, are at, already at that state where they are higher than they were even in the April or May outbreak. Um, so we're sitting uh, at, at just above 80% of our peak 
And the red line here are ICU patients. We're at over 60% of our peak in terms of ICU patients, and but luckily only about 40% of our ventilator peak. One of the things we are seeing with better early treatment, we've talked about this before in this call with remdesivir, with steroids, with convalescent plasma, we do feel we're reducing the incidence of folks needing to be in the ICU and certainly reducing the incidence of folks needing to be on the ventilator um, over time as we've learned better how to take care of uh, this illness. But you can imagine with the hospital census going up, um, at some point you reach a breaking point. One of the other things that's unique in region in seven and eight, this is the hospital census in those areas, um, really unprecedented heights for during the entire pandemic for region seven. And similarly for um, oh, region seven in there twice, I think region eight looks very similar. Uh, that's really at unprecedented heights uh, for the pandemic for this time of the year. Um, last uh, thing I will share is the university dashboard. Uh, many of you who uh, have uh, employees uh, who maybe have a spouse that works at the university, or you might have a child yourself uh, at the university might be paying attention. This is a dashboard. If you uh, type in Ohio State University and COVID dashboard, you, this is all transparent and publicly available. Um, one of the things you can see down, this is all data that's about the general state of affairs in central Ohio and in, in the state of Ohio. But at the bottom is all university specific data. And one thing I'll point out to you, you can see here, we're testing between two and 3,000 people per day. So essentially all of the undergrads on campus are tested uh, weekly. And then a selection of the undergrads and grad students that live off campus are tested uh, weekly. Our seven day rolling average you can see here is at about 0.7, 0.8%, which is really outstanding. If you look back, uh, this is day, that, that same day to just express differently back in late August, early September, we were, uh, this purple line is all students who were tested. We were at about 5% uh, positive, and this is with testing everyone. So it's a, uh, it's a significant improvement to get from, uh, you know, uh, essentially one tenth the positivity rate where we were just about six weeks ago. And I think speaks uh, volumes to what uh, the university, as well as obviously our students, have done to change behaviors and how you can really change the course of uh, one of these outbreaks with uh, the basic skills of masking, distancing, washing your hands if you're sick, getting tested, getting isolated, um, and then certainly uh, washing high touch surfaces. In our case, it might be bathrooms and elevator buttons and stair rails. And in your business, it's a different set of, uh, of things that you need to keep clean. But uh, that's just some basic data on where we are with uh, the pandemic. And uh, I'll send it back to you, Gail. Thanks, Dr. Thomas. In addition to that, can you give us an update on testing? You kind of alluded to that when you talked about what you're doing at Ohio State. But do you know what we're doing as a county so the, the, all the hospitals in the county, as well as multiple, uh, the neighborhood health centers, the Columbus uh, Department of Health are all doing testing. Uh, we are seeing a little bit better supply chain over the past few weeks. We've actually all moved back in September uh, to testing asymptomatic individuals. If you remember, there was a period of time when we had significant shortages in our supply chain mm -hmm. of testing uh, reagent that we had to really limit the number of asymptomatic individuals we were testing. The, uh, the positivity rate for the county is holding relatively firm. If you actually like, as I said, Franklin County has more cases than we would like. We are over that 100 threshold, but compared to a lot of other, uh, that 100 per 100,000 threshold, but compared to a lot of other parts of the state, we're actually doing quite well. And if you look at the case rate compared to our worst over the summer, you know, our case, uh, new case positivity rate is down significantly over the past uh, five to six weeks. Great, thanks Dr. Thomas for that update. And Dr. Borchers, there's so much speculation around this football game coming up this weekend. And that first game is Saturday. We wanted you to share insights into the season, what protocols are in place for the team, the Ohio State Athletics Program. And as you mentioned to me earlier, it is a unique situation that you are facing. Well, it certainly is, Gail. Good morning, and thank you for having me this morning. Uh, it's been a very interesting uh, last uh, eight or nine weeks. Uh, as we have began uh, to return to competition for the Big Ten Conference, as many of those on this call will know, uh, on August 11th, the presidents and chancellors of the Big Ten institutions made a decision to postpone competition uh, based on uh, lack of clear data and testing protocols for institutions. And uh, beginning shortly after that, I was asked to co-chair the medical committee uh, subcommittee on the return to competition task force for the Big Ten Conference. 
that started a process uh, involving uh, experts from all 14 institutions in the Big Ten Conference to answer very specific questions uh, around our ability to return athletes uh, uh, to competition uh, that focused on specific areas of data, which Dr. Thomas has shown here this morning that the Big Ten Conference is focused on specifically for their institutions. Consistent testing protocols, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, the ability uh, to adequately uh, assess and provide health care for our student athletes uh, during this time and to make certain that the situations where they're participating are safe. And so as Dr. Thomas was just discussing about testing, uh, the Big Ten Conference uh, has moved towards a surveillance testing uh, protocol for all of their athletes, uh, which includes, as many are aware now, a daily antigen test as part of their surveillance programming, along with daily symptom monitoring, temperature monitoring, um, and then actual uh, monitoring throughout the day for health and well-being of the athletes. If that antigen test is positive, the individuals are immediately isolated and they go on to get confirmatory PCR testing, which is the molecular diagnostic testing that we do to make the diagnosis of COVID-19. We have about three and a half weeks worth of data now in the uh, Big Ten Conference with football, which is the only sport that has begun to return to competition. As you mentioned, uh, first game in the Big Ten Conference is tomorrow evening, Illinois and Wisconsin, and then six games on Saturday. And uh, very happy to say that uh, the numbers are very encouraging. Uh, there is significant uh, uh, success uh, in this across all 14 institutions uh, with um, all of the uh, individuals involved in these competitions um, showing very little, if any, signs of infection among those groups. And just to reiterate what Dr. Thomas said, I think that is an excellent reflection of their commitment to maintain adequate behaviors to prevent infection, which is masking avoiding other large gatherings, avoiding people outside of their athletics uh, setting that they're not uh, usually coming in contact with, avoiding travel um, and uh, making certain that they're, you know, using good hygiene, washing their hands and things like that. That being said, we're staying vigilant day to day um, in order to return to competition um, and uh, hoping uh, that uh, with continued success of this programming will not only show the way forward for the next nine weeks for the Big Ten Conference in football, but for the rest of the student athletes in a return to competition. Dr. Borchers, you had mentioned uh, some of the expectations of the athletes off the field. How much, how important is that? And how much is that emphasized by your program? Well, it is the most important thing. Um, we have said all along that the programming protocols we put in place uh, will reflect the behaviors and the um, uh, commitment by those individuals uh, to participate in those behaviors. And so it is emphasized multiple times a day on how important it is uh, for the athletes, the staffs, the coaches that are part of those uh, groups of people involved in that return to competition uh, to follow those behaviors. And without that, there wouldn't be success in this programming. So there's been uh, excellent role modeling by these individuals to stay committed to that behavior in order for them to be able to compete. I do want to remind our participants who are on this webinar that Dr. Thomas and Dr. Porgers will take your questions. Just go to the Q&A section of the Zoom at the bottom of your screen and let us know what you'd like to ask them and we will pass it along. Um, is there a plan in place, Dr. Borchers, to manage an outbreak if one of the coaches or one of the players came down and, you know, it would just be one person? Well, there is. So that individual, if they, as I mentioned, if they have a surveillance test that uh, identifies them as a presumptive positive, they're immediately isolated from the group during that testing process. You know, we get immediate point of care, rapid results. So those results are known within 15 minutes. And so that individual is isolated and then they get uh, confirmatory testing with the uh, PCR molecular testing in order to confirm whether or not they're positive. But we're not just uh, isolating individuals just based on testing. Uh, individuals that may be symptomatic, that may not be feeling well, as Dr. Thomas mentioned, are asked to stay home. We communicate virtually with those individuals, uh, do virtual assessments, have them tested if needed uh, again. Um, so we're really putting a lot of um, measures in place that will prevent anyone who is potentially infectious uh, from becoming part of that group. And so far that strategy has worked really well for our teams uh, throughout the conference. Well, let's talk about the fans. What are they going to expect? 
Well, I hope what the fans expect is that they'll stay home and cheer the Buckeyes uh, from their home with their close family and friends, uh, because it's really important to the success of this team and to our community um, that we model their behavior, which is uh, behavior to prevent uh, spread throughout the community. And although it's not what we're used to, um, uh, you know, it's not what uh, uh, what Buckeye Nation is used to in uh, having a football game. It's what we have to do this year in order to compete. And so we've asked everyone to um, consider every game as a home game, a home game for the fans and uh, spend your time at home, uh, watch the game with your family, um, watch the game, cheer, cheer the Buckeyes on, but help them to be successful in, the, in their efforts to conduct this season. Now, we're asking fans not to come to campus, uh, to you know, um, make certain uh, that um, they're giving this team and this uh, Ohio State community and student athletes every opportunity to compete successfully. Um, and we're hoping that Buckeye Nation, as they always do, will support us uh, in those efforts. Speaking of fans and tailgating and getting together, Dr. Thomas, I know you have said that while it appears businesses and schools, the universities are doing well, it's people in their personal lives that we seem to be seeing where there is spread. So advice for these folks? Well, I think the advice is relatively simple. If, if it's not um, someone who lives in your home, you know, you need to really take those same precautions. So when, uh, I mean, this is literally even coming from the White House weekly report on the current status of the outbreak in Ohio, it's showing up in the contact tracing that local health departments do when they reach individuals and talk about where they might have gotten this. There aren't a lot of things that, frankly, uh, government regulators, the public health individuals can do at this point beyond what they've already done, which is asking bars to stop serving alcohol at 10 o'clock. Um, and then uh, certainly putting some limitations on large group mass events. Uh, there are, as you know, some significant uh, limitations, for example, in the Bengals and Browns and a lot of other things that are just plain canceled like large concerts and other things. Uh, the university's taken approach as has the rest of the Big Ten of saying we're gonna start out with only families as Jim uh, referenced in his uh, comments. But it's, um, you know, the, the, the personal, um, behaviors of whether it's your employees or our neighbors or our employees, our patients, in the case of, of Jim and myself, that's really where the rubber meets the road. Because frankly, in most of your businesses, there are rules and people are generally used to following the rules at work. Frankly, there are rules in schools. Our kids are pretty used to following the rules in school. Um, you know, there's certainly risks in all those environments compared to not having them. But I think those risks are manageable in order to keep our economy open, to educate our children, et, et cetera. Where it really comes down is people not using that same sense of responsibility when they are, you know, hanging out with their neighbors, when they're, obviously, we have very big concerns with Thanksgiving and uh, the holiday season coming up in December, uh, that people are going to really drop their guard and, and hang out with family members, uh, hang out with friends uh, in a way that will be a little less uh, responsible than we'd like. So, I, I, there's no other way to say it. It's, it's doing the, it, cause everyone's fatigued by, by coronavirus. Trust me, Jim and I are at the top of that list as being fatigued by coronavirus, but we know that it's impacting everyone's mental and emotional health as much as a lot of people's physical health. But as a society, if we're going to get this thing under control, keep it under control so we can keep our kids in school. So we can, uh, um, keep our businesses open. So we can see the football team play on Saturdays. We're going to have to make some of these tough decisions in the short term. Uh, we can talk a little bit later about, you know, where this may be a year from now or, or so, but I think for the time being, as we move into what would already be a, a, a flu season, uh, an upper respiratory infection season, as people move indoors, uh, the virus tends to hang in the air longer when there's less humidity, all those sorts of things just don't bode well for uh, the winter. Uh, so it's it's extra vigilance is I think all we can ask people to do. Dr. Borch, there's a question to you regarding other collegiate athletics at Ohio State. You said at this point it's football, but will you um, see how football goes in deciding what you do as the year goes on? What What is the outlook for other collegiate sports at OSU? Oh, it's, no, it's a great question. We have plans in place currently for men's and women's basketball and men's ice hockey to return as they're the next seasons that are there. And then we're actually meeting now to discuss how the other sports, as you're probably aware, the other fall sports uh, championships were delayed by the NCAA until the spring of 2021. So those seasons will be happening in the spring. 
Um, we're obviously monitoring what's going on, but we'll have plans in place for those athletes in sports as well as we move forward, as they get closer to start dates in January of 2021. I think it's really important to recognize, though, that so much has changed uh, even in the past you know, few weeks and will continue to change, as Dr. Thomas mentioned, with what happens in our communities uh, around this uh, transmission and what happens at our university communities. So we know that we're going to have to be able to be flexible uh, in hoping to get all of these athletes back to the sports uh, that they're here to compete in. And in your experience, what has the attitude been of the athletes other than disappointment? <laughs> <laughs> Are they embracing was, the rules and regulations? Yeah, I think you're right. I think initially disappointment and frustration um, because they put a lot of work and effort, obviously, into their athletic endeavors while they're students here at Ohio State. It's something that they come here to, to do. But I will tell you that their role modeling for the behaviors to be successful has been exemplary. I mean, their commitment to following behaviors um, to make certain that they are reducing their risk of being exposed uh, and um, being potentially infectious to their teammates is really admirable. Um, the data has been uh, better than I think any of us thought it would be. And I think that's their commitment and their motivation to wanna to be able to compete. And I think if we, as Dr. Thomas mentioned, embrace that motivation uh, throughout our businesses, schools, personal lives, uh, we'll see a huge impact on what's going on in our communities. Um, so I have been uh, extremely impressed with the response of, uh, of our students, of our athletic department, of our coaches, our staffs. Um, and I'm hopeful that uh, that'll continue and obviously uh, give them the opportunities they want to be able to compete. Yeah, Jim, I remember yeah. our discussions over the summer when, uh, when we had to close the athletic facility right after July 4th. We had a kind of a spate of positives there uh, uh, based on probably some less than responsible behavior over the July 4th holiday weekend. And I think we all were really had gone from being optimistic in June to pretty pessimistic that we were going to be able to make it through. But I, I just think the, the work that uh, the team has done, the coaches, and frankly, reaching out to parents and really mm -hmm. tugging at heartstrings of, you know, you need to encourage your child, your son to, to do this the right way. It's, it's all been best practice work from, from my uh, perspective. So thank you for all you've done. No, I appreciate Dr. that. Thomas, I, go ahead, Dr. Borges. I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to just say uh, to Dr. Thomas's comments, I think that uh, we've learned through athletics, um, actually the two biggest risk factors for getting the virus have nothing to do with competing in athletics from what we've seen in outbreaks uh, across the country. The first largest risk factor has been when there have been bye weeks and student athletes have traveled or gone to areas that they're um, outside their communities and uh, have exposed themselves to individuals uh, um, in different communities. And the second biggest risk factor has then been family and friends visiting them and their community uh, coming in. Um, but we really have not seen spread during the athletic events themselves. And so I think once our student athletes recognized what their real risk factors were, they were able to modify their behaviors and we're seeing the uh, results of that. And I think as much as we always like Gail to compare ourselves to that school up north, many of you might have seen earlier this week and knock on wood, um, you know, they now are on a two week lockdown for their entire student body because they are now in the middle of their semester with the opposite trend of cases. So it's, it's not, as you look at, at, at various examples around the country, this has not been easy to do. Uh, it's a lot of hard work on a lot of people, not just on the administrative team side, but really the students that have taken this seriously, their friends, their family have taken it seriously. And uh, it's just, it's just terrific to see. Yeah, yeah, Jim, one, one thing to, as you, you got very um, knowledgeable, obviously, about testing and testing strategies related to this. Uh, we've talked about it many times. Could you share with some of the folks that, obviously, as an employer, they also have a body of people they're trying to keep safe when they come to work, and how antigen testing maybe has, I know there's positives and negatives compared to PCR testing, how as those become more available over time, how does that relate to what they do in their work? Yeah, I think really similar, Dr. Thomas, to what we do with athletes in a surveillance mode. So being able to test frequently with antigen testing and to rapidly identify someone who may be positive and then isolate them from their workplace population, which is exactly the strategy we've used, obviously, in athletics. And as you mentioned, there's pluses and minuses to testing, but really with antigen testing, it's the 
ease of use. It's the ability to get those rapid results and then make immediate decisions that we feel is really affected our surveillance mode model. And I think for schools, businesses, this is going to be a way to consider surveillance in the future, you know, as they move forward. And as you mentioned, as antigen testing becomes um, more available. Um, and so I think what we have done will actually provide some information to translate to the workplace where you have congregate groups or populations of people that are coming to the same place every day in a way to do surveillance on those populations to a certain safety from infection. And so um, our ability to do those tests immediately right at the athletic facility, just as they would be able to do at the workplace, to get those results in a rapid fashion within 15 minutes, and then be able to make decisions immediately rather than waiting a certain amount of time, which sometimes can be hours or sometimes even days to be able to make that decision when the infection's already potentially spread, is really going to be helpful, I think, in certain populations like work place populations. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think right now uh, those tests aren't widely available yet, uh, but the, the cost of them is in the five to ten dollar per test range as opposed to the 80 to 100, 120 dollar range for PCR tests that take 12 to 36 to 48 hours to come back. So I, I do think it's a model. But the one thing I will say and you emphasize, Jim, it's the repetitive testing over time, because if you look at any one <clears throat> point in time, uh, those individuals can have a, a false negative rate. So someone actually has it and there's a false negative rate of 20 to 30 percent when someone's early on in the illness. So it's that idea of repetitive testing every day, every yeah. couple of days will allow you to catch that person while they're on the upswing before even maybe they become symptomatic or are shedding the virus uh, that you might catch them if you did a PCR. But once again, all the negatives are on cost and turnaround time, invasiveness of the PCR test. I think we'll really make antigen testing probably something that, that will be more broadly used as we move into the winter and into next spring. Yeah, I think you're right, Dr. Thomas. And I think that's exactly the model that our epidemiologists, infectious disease folks discussed when we were discussing how to return athletes, you know, safely to competition. But I think it'll translate, as you mentioned, returning students safely to their activities, but certainly returning people to the workplace as well. That same model with frequent uh, antigen testing will uh, will be applicable. You know, one of the things that you also uh, were involved in over the summer was the evaluation of myocarditis or <clears throat> heart muscle inflammation related, related to people who've had COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about not so much in the you know high-end intercollegiate athlete, but really in the average high-intensity exercise or someone who goes jogging, works out at the gym, et cetera? Yeah, I think, you know, that as you mentioned, uh, when we think about uh, COVID-19, we know that COVID-19 has some interesting uh, involvement uh, because of the way that it uh, uh, works uh, with various receptors and such to the heart muscle. And so um, we've seen studies where we have to be vigilant about uh, what the involvement in someone in their post-COVID period is. Certainly for anyone who's active that's had COVID, uh, we'd recommend that they see their healthcare provider before they get back to exercise to discuss their symptoms and then also to discuss an adequate return to you know exercise program and making certain that they're monitoring for any additional symptoms moving forward or getting appropriate testing and decision-making with their healthcare provider is gonna be really important. Myocarditis, as you know, is, uh, is an, uh, you know, a complication that we wanna be aware of uh, with, um, with this virus, especially in uh, people that are active uh, uh, because there can be consequences overall um, and we don't wanna be you know, alarmist about it, but we need to be knowledgeable about it and work with the patients when they're coming back from COVID before they get back to activity and exercise. So um, certainly something that was important, as you mentioned, in the high end uh, elite athlete, uh, like our big 10 athletes, but just as important uh, for people like myself that are recreational plotters or runners uh, as we uh, go about trying to keep ourselves fit uh, and making certain uh, that we're doing so in a healthy fashion. Thanks, Dr. Borchers. Dr. Thomas, I think I have a question for you from one of the viewers on the webinar, because in the, you just talked about the antigen tests. The question is, when will businesses in Columbus be able to get these tests for their employees and who provides them? So there are um, multiple uh, what I would call different platforms uh, for antigen testing. Uh, there are a couple of those platforms that uh, require um, essentially a box, right, where the test is put in there and, and run. There's the, the newest platform that Abbott has released is a card-based um, platform that's essentially like um, 
almost like a pregnancy test. It's, it's relatively simple. There's no machine that, that you use. Uh, so some of those are available now. Uh, some of them are on back order, depending on if you go out and try, you know, commercially to buy them. But I mean, there are, they are available in the marketplace. Uh, the Abbott ones, at this point, the federal government has purchased uh, the entire supply. I believe it was 150 million uh, of those. And they are distributing those to the states based on state's proportionate population. So uh, since we're doing some pilot work for the state, we do have some of those on site as of last week that we're using in a couple of pilot programs. The state's also sharing those with K through 12 school systems, some local jails, uh, ODRC facilities, where we're just kind of learning how best to use those. Uh, tests uh, we're considering here at the university about, because we already have a large testing program about how we can use that potentially to test some high risk staff. Uh, we're still working through some of the details on that. So it, it really would depend on what your use case is, how frequently you want to test. Um, and then certainly it, the, the, all of the tests are what are called CLIA waived, which means they can happen outside of a CLIA lab, uh, an approved a federal regulatory approved lab. However, they do need to be run by a healthcare professional. So a nurse, uh, someone who's been trained in how to, to use them. So there are uh, some things I'll talk about in a second, some ways that we can help local businesses try to think through what their testing strategy would be. Uh, that's a, a big part of what we'd like to sit down with any local business that, that would like some assistance thinking through those options. Uh, we'd be happy to, to delve more into the details. Dr. Thomas, before we go, I wanted to ask you about the new CDC guidelines that were announced yesterday. And especially as we talk about people worried about their personal space or employers worried about how often they interact with each other. Can you explain? Yeah, I, I sure can. Uh, so the, the previous uh, definition of a close contact from the CDC's perspective was within six feet for greater than 15 minutes. And typically it talks about in a confined space, so indoors. Uh, but uh, one of the changes that was announced yesterday, and I'm actually a little surprised they didn't get more publicity, is they changed the standard from a 15 minute period of time to 15 minutes over the course of a 24 hour period. So you can imagine if somebody had five minute interactions six times over a 24 hour period, that's 30 minutes. That now will count as a close contact, where by the definition that the CDC had released in the past, it needed to be a 15 minute period. So you can kind of guess that there's a variety of work settings and even potentially even home settings where that could be, uh, or personal settings where that could be uh, at issue. But I think it really comes down to the impact it'll have on schools, uh, the impact that it will have on, on uh, workplaces in terms of defining that window of time uh, differently and will, will most likely lead to a larger uh, number of people uh, for any one particular outbreak being uh, quarantined. Um, it is also really important to note that the use of a face mask is not included in the formula that the CDC uses uh, for defining close contact. So if you're within six feet, even if you have a mask on, say you're within six feet for 45 minutes with someone and they become ill, you are going to um, need to quarantine. So that does call into question in some people's minds, the value of the face mask. The, the concern the CDC has is that people may not wear the face mask correctly. They may lie they were wearing the face mask, all sorts of things. Now, the state and the governor actually announced this uh, a week or so ago. Uh, we are um, looking with our College of Public Health and a couple of local K through 12 school districts uh, around the state at a potential pilot to look at some different uh, ways to actually test uh, using the antigen testing uh, to test those folks that would be in quarantine status just to see exactly what the risk is in the K through 12 school setting where you have a teacher observing what's going on in the classroom. Uh, and then we may be able to, to, to uh, change some of that uh, policy within the state of Ohio. But to be honest, now where we are with incident, increasing incidence of uh, cases, I'm not sure that we'll eventually be able to actually roll that out. But uh, that, that's a, it's a huge change to have that 15 minute period to be 15 minutes over 24 hours. Does that make sense? Thanks. Yes, it does. Thank you very much for that explanation. I had a couple other things I just wanted to go through quickly, um, just do. as updates. Uh, so one of the other, um, uh, we already talked a little bit about trying to encourage your employees in their personal life uh, to, uh, uh, to really you know, follow those same restrictions they follow at work in terms of wearing a mask, distancing, washing their hands, et cetera. I think also trying to encourage them to uh, help inform 
their neighbors, their friends, the, the other parents on their kids' soccer team, whatever it might be about these things. I know as a healthcare organization, that's one of the things that we are trying to emphasize to our nurses, our pharmacists, our other healthcare providers to say that, you know, you may be the closest that your neighbors, folks you go to church with, whatever it is, get to a public health expert. It's kind of your job to make sure they understand what they need to do. So if you can encourage your employees uh, to do the same, that'd be great. Uh, we did talk at our last uh, webinar about flu shots. And I, for those of you who weren't on, just the importance of making sure that your employees, whether it's through their local primary care physician, whether it's through the local pharmacy, whether it's a, a flu blitz that you do at work, uh, that they're getting their flu shots because some of the same symptoms for the flu are the same symptoms for COVID. And it'll help us reduce the complexity of what's going on if we know that people have had a flu vaccine. Also, it should reduce the incidence of people needing to be admitted uh, to the hospital. I can tell you on, on our part as an organization, we require people to have a flu shot by December 1st. Normally in mid-November, we have to start really reminding people, urging people and, and uh, harassing them to come in and get their flu shot. This year, uh, we got some data on Monday that we're over 50% compliance in mid-October, which is unheard of. For So we think the uptake of flu shots is going to be higher this year because people are so focused on this. But the more you can do to encourage your uh, employees uh, the better. A little bit on the COVID vaccine, speaking of vaccinations, uh, just yesterday at four o'clock, the High Department of Health had their first uh, webinar about how healthcare organizations can sign up to be part of the distribution uh, channels uh, for the COVID vaccine. Uh, there is some thinking that potentially late November, potentially in December, the first uh, dribs and drabs of the supply of COVID vaccine will be coming into the state. Uh, so the state is working ahead and uh, setting up that network, whether it's individual physician practices, pharmacies, hospitals, uh, where they'll be able to distribute uh, that vaccine and get it into patients' arms uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, phase one of that vaccine is expected, to, uh, the guidelines are expected to say uh, it will basically be for uh, uh, healthcare employees, as well as uh, high risk elderly and other high risk uh, patients. And then it'll kind of go down as the risk of severe disease uh, and, and it'll be kind of stratified as more vaccine becomes available. But one of the things we're doing as uh, the State Medical Association, the State Hospital Association, and others is actually trying to define what is a healthcare worker, because that's a big black box. You can imagine that the, uh, there's obviously doctors and nurses that do more high risk things in the ER, ICUs, emergency department than, say, someone who works in our dermatology clinic in terms of their risk of catching COVID uh, from a patient. But also when you think about it, there's a lot of unlicensed people. There's nurses aides, there's the, the custodians that clean the floor, there's people that deliver the meals that work in those same high risk areas that are just as much at risk as the healthcare providers. So we're trying to define that much more broadly. Uh, the reality is uh, I'm not gonna probably be first in line to get the vaccine. Someone who works in our finance or legal department's not gonna be first in line to get the vaccine. We wanna make sure if it's a limited capacity that we have the highest uh, risk people being first in line. Um, but I do think there's some good news on the vaccine front still, even though there's been a couple of trials that have been paused, that's a relatively normal thing uh, for vaccine trials uh, as they evaluate an individual who may have had a, a side effect. Uh, but I do think that uh, coming into the spring and certainly into the summer, I think there'll be far more vaccine available uh, than uh, maybe people had projected. And I'm, I'm, I'm still a little bullish that, uh, you know, by the time kids go back to school in the fall, we may be back a little bit more to some semblance of normalcy. It may not be completely with 110,000 people climbing all over each other in the stadium next fall for football games. But I'm hopeful that for those who want to get vaccinated, uh, that, uh, that they'll be able to. The one thing I will share is we do have some survey data that the State Hospital Association has done that as many as a third, if not more, of adults in the state of Ohio are essentially saying they they refuse to get the COVID vaccine because they don't trust it. So there's going to be a lot of I think you know positive messaging, reassurance. This has been studied. This has been trialed. And certainly, if healthcare workers are standing in line getting it in their arm, hopefully that'll reassure our patients. But that may be uh, probably the biggest marketing challenge that you may have as employers going into the uh, you know late winter, early spring as it becomes more available is, in, is just convincing your employees that it's safe to get the vaccine. So there'll be obviously much more we can talk about that uh, moving forward on these uh, 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 webinars in the future. Um, we talked about antigen testing uh, already. And the last thing I'll, I'll mention, this is really dovetails into our next um, 
our next webinars is uh, we have now uh, entered our second monoclonal antibody trial. We've been in the Eli Lilly monoclonal antibody trial now, uh, two different versions of that trial. And we just uh, earlier this week enrolled our first two patients in the Regeneron uh, anti anti uh, clonal or sorry, monoclonal antibody uh, trial, which is the same um, uh, medication uh, trial that the president received when he was at Walter Reed. So earlier this week, we enrolled our first two patients in that uh, trial as well. We're pretty bullish on, on that. If you think about what monoclonal antibodies are, they're essentially like we've been doing convalescent plasma. So taking the plasma of patients who've already had it, uh, had coronavirus and, and getting their antibodies in, in, you know, injected essentially, infused into uh, another patient. What this basically is, is lab created antibodies that target different parts of the virus uh, that will um, hopefully be a really important part of our uh, therapeutics moving forward. The downside of those drugs is they're incredibly expensive. Uh, so I still, we were uh, uh, doing one of these webinars for a different uh, group uh, a, a week or so ago and just reminding them that that the last thing you want, it, it's a little bit like saying, I'm not gonna wear my seatbelt because I have an airbag in my car. <laughs> First of all, you just don't wanna wreck the car, right? Okay. You don't wanna say, well, because we now have great therapies, I don't have to wear a mask because they'll save my life. Like that's not the right way to think about it. These things cost thousands of dollars per dose uh, they're very expensive. It's great if we need it to save your life, but I'd much rather have you wear a mask and not crash the car to begin with, not get the vaccine uh, to begin with instead of waiting to rely on uh, the airbag to go off. So just like Jim would love it if the defense kept him outside the 25 yard line and not have to make the goal line stand every time, right, Jim? Your, your, your heart would beat great, a little less hard on the sideline. Great, fo great football analogy. Yes. I always try with the football <laughs> analogy. Um, so anyway, that's all I have in terms of updates, Gail. Any questions on uh, any of the further updates? I think we're good. I'm going to push you to um, talk to the businesses on this webinar about how Ohio State can help them in the future and now is fighting COVID and taking care of their employees. Sure. We've covered this a little bit in the past, but you'll be getting uh, an email communication uh, early next week. Anyone who's been on any of these webinars since we started, plus obviously we have a number of other kind of corporate engagement email lists uh, that, that will be going out really around our uh, consulting uh, program. Um, we have really uh, multiple different levels. There's obviously webinars like this that are, are going to remain uh, free. Uh, but then in terms of the multiple uh, strata that you'll see in the program, there's a train the trainer model where we will put either someone from your HR group or your safety officer or whatever it might be, essentially to create a COVID safety officer for your organization to train them in what our epidemiology people, our infectious disease people, Dr. Gonsenhauser, Dr. Moeller, myself, that in, in, in as much as we can train them what we know about coronavirus. So that's kind of one model where you can engage essentially in a train the trainer model where that person then can be in your organization seven days a week, providing feedback, providing uh, uh, consultative efforts uh, uh, internally in the organization. Uh, another level of the um, uh, relationship can be around consultation. So that can be either a phone-based uh, consultation or even an in-person consultation. And the way we see that is it could vary anything from, um, I have an employee who, test, who called me this morning and said that they tested positive, help me think through what I need to do now. Um, obviously, we don't take the place of the local health department. They may still call you and work with you, but we can do is give you some advice uh, that is best practice practice advice uh, ahead of time to try and get you started down that path. Um, also, we can help you think through physical space, either in your office or if you're a manufacturing company, think through your, how your physical space is outlined. We can do some of that certainly over the phone consultation. And then there's the opportunity where we can actually send someone out to your business for a four hour window of time, a physician and an epidemiology nurse to walk through your shop floor, to walk through your office space and, and give you feedback and advice on different uh, best practices around physical space. And then last is kind of what we talked about a few minutes ago, Gail, and that's really the testing strategy. As new testing methodologies come up, uh, we can help advise you on what makes sense from a cost and quality and timeliness perspective uh, so that you're not being uh, essentially sold a bill of goods by a vendor. Uh, and you, you recognize what are the pros and the cons of any one of these decisions, because none of them are perfect. Uh, that, you know, low cost, always accurate, turnaround time in two minutes, that's just not doesn't exist right now. So it's really the trade-offs of cost, turnaround time, and accuracy that we can help you think through what makes sense for your workforce. 
So you'll be getting more information. Uh, you'll see an email that'll come out from Dr. Moeller, Dr. Gonsenhauser, and myself uh, early next week that will invite you to uh, participate uh, and build a relationship with us. Uh, there's actually uh, both a pricing model as well as uh, more of a kind of subscription slash contract uh, that we'd be happy to uh, work with any of you on. Uh, we're building that infrastructure now to provide those uh, services and they'll be ready to go uh, next week. Thanks, Dr. Thomas. And these webinars will continue. We already have a couple lined up for November. I'm Dr. Thomas, I believe you're gonna be joining us for everyone, but can you give us um, a rundown of who else might be joining us then I in the coming month? I can. Can you see my screen? Well, I did, and now it's disappeared. There it is. Oh, wonderful. So on Tuesday, November 10th, uh, we will be having a webinar with a couple of our researchers, uh, Dr. Rama Malampati and Dr. Carlos Malvestudo, really looking at convalescent plasma and monoclonal antibodies. Uh, I already talked a little bit about that today, but we'll have much more experience. Uh, Carlos is the, is the um, principal investigator on our antibody uh, trials in Dr. Malampali's letter convalescent plasma program. Obviously, we'll also have our routine updates that we provide uh, around what's going on with the virus, what's going on with the uh, vaccine, all those things. And then normally we do these every two weeks, but because of the Thanksgiving holiday, we are going to do one on November 17th, so just a week later. Uh, we'll have Sue Kolatar back, uh, from, uh, who's, who's our principal investigator on all of our vaccine trials. I think by that November 17th webinar, we'll have a much better idea of what's actually going on with uh, COVID vaccine uh, timelines of when some vaccine may be available, those sorts of things. So uh, if you're interested in the vaccine, I'd, I'd highly recommend the November 17th webinar. And then we're going to do a little bit more of an update on, uh, on testing strategies. So uh, November 10th, November 17th, uh, you'll obviously get emails about those and we look forward to you participating. We will see you then. Dr. Thomas, thank you so much. Dr. Borgers, it's been a pleasure to have you as well. And, you know, and we got to say, go Bucks. I mean, <laughs> we got to, yeah, we got to. Thank you both for joining us today. And thank you all for joining us as well. And I also want to give you that email address that Dr. Thomas was talking about if you would like more information about how to explore partnership opportunities with Ohio State. That's COVID-19 consulting at osumc.edu. COVID-19 consulting at osumc.edu. Thank you all. Uh, be safe, be well, and have a good day. Thanks, Gail. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Take care, everybody.